Carnegie Town Hall and those of you watching us on, uh, on uh, CityLink. It is the, this is the Tuesday, December 4th informational meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council. We'll begin with the Land Use Committee report. Councillor Rolfing. Thank you. We had a, <clears throat> we had a, a very good Land Use uh, Committee meeting. And uh, I've been a little out of pocket. I apologize. I'm uh, uh, not quite ready for this, but uh, we uh, could uh, one of the other committee members help me on that? Okay. I'm, I'm, I, I apologize. I am not ready to uh, will, uh, maybe make a report on that. So if you could pass me over this time, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. Councilor Rolfing, we, uh, no apologies necessary. We have uh, many council members uh, busy with other items going on in their lives um, the last couple of weeks. And so we appreciate that. We will take a report on the Land Use Committee at a later time. I would then move to City Council open discussion. Any items for open discussion? Councilor Staggers. Yes, uh, uh, I've, somebody asked me if there's any possibility we could have the uh, Snowgate petition update first or not. Um, you know, because we have guests coming, or we have guests who are here, I'm gonna stick with the, with the agenda the way that it is. I wish that you had asked me that prior to the meeting. I might have been able to work that out, but we have promised guests that this is the order that it would be in. Um, I, I would certainly have entertained that if I had known that prior to, but we're going to stick with the schedule the way that it is. Okay. Thank That's you. Good. Okay. Other open discussion items? <laughs> then I would just take a moment of personal privilege, privilege and thank my fellow council members and city staff and council staff especially. I have been gone for the last two and a half weeks with a sick child in college and uh, dealing with, uh, he was in the hospital for 12 days and it has been, as I told Councillor Karski, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life and I just appreciate my friends being around me and the support and the encouragement that I had uh, via email and phone calls. I just, uh, I know uh, what a supportive community this is and I've really learned that this last couple weeks and so I thank you for that. And uh, he is on the mend and will be home for Christmas so we're excited about that. So. Moving on then, if there's no other open discussion items, we'll start with presentations. Sioux Falls Development Foundation annual, annual Report to the Council by Slater Barr, President. Welcome, Slater. Okay, well thank you for the opportunity. Um, that is much louder. You know, this past year, as I reflected on it, it really reminds me of those uh, illustrations that, uh, you know, you see of the, uh, the kid with the snowball that wads it up and starts rolling it down this hill and it starts building upon itself and gaining speed and momentum. And that's really kind of how I, where I feel that we've been. Um, we started with a fairly simple concept of marketing that we can't just sit and wait for the phone to ring. And we believed that Sioux Falls had a great story to tell and that we had to take that message to a broader national and international audience. So we enlisted some volunteer help from the Chamber and the Development Foundation leadership to guide uh, the development of that marketing and provide oversight to some new promotional efforts. Scott Lawrence of Lawrence and Schiller agreed to chair the Ford Sioux Falls Marketing Task Force. Tom Simmons with Midco Communications and Chrissy Myers with the American Heart Association rounded out that leadership team. They started with some basics, uh, defining our value proposition. And the question that they asked is, uh, in other words, what would your elevator speech be? If someone asked you, tell me in 20 seconds why Sioux Falls is a good location for business. Well, that proved to be more difficult than it seems, not like most communities that have a difficult time coming up with really good things to talk about, but go, because we have so much to share, it's hard to coalesce it down into a uh, really concise message. So we ended up with this as our value proposition. 
And in the packets that I provided to you, if you pulled out my business card and flip it over, you'll see that we put the value proposition on the back of the business card. And here's what we came up with. Sioux Falls may have low business costs, but it is the high value that differentiates us. We're a forward-thinking community that makes a, mixes a highly productive workforce, a secure business environment, world-class research in the medical and energy industries, and cultural amenities that exceed our size. And so that's what we came up with. I think that sounds like Sioux Falls. This led to the formation of an economic development and marketing brands for our promotional efforts outside of our community and state. And that brand is on the front of your packet. It's very simple and direct. It just says Sioux Falls, better business, better life. Next, our website underwent a complete overhaul. Instead of trying to be all things to all people, uh, we decided to focus on site selectors, those executives and businessmen that were making decisions about where to place new or expanded facilities. So a comprehensive overhaul of the website. And with that foundation under us, the real marketing began. Let me just share some numbers with you. This year, our radio ads in the Twin Cities garnered 4,714,000 impressions. Telemarketing efforts to corporate decision makers made 5,000 phone calls to reach 319 decision makers. As you can imagine, that's kind of a hard slog. Those 319 conversations, though, generated 55 conference calls and 44 face-to-face -face appointments. We worked trade shows such as medical device and manufacturing, data center world, and bio. We visited nine companies at their home offices outside of the state. We really focused on site selection consultants, those firms that are hired to assist companies in finding the ideal location for their next facility. I've been in personal meetings with 34 of them. We hosted several in lunches in New York and Chicago. And as well, we brought five of them on a familiarization tour of Sioux Falls. And as we have things to announce, we send e-postcards, electronic postcards, to about 260 of these consultants. So I've included in your package, you'll see some things that say Sioux Falls announces. So whenever we get good stories that would be relevant to these site selection consultants, uh, we sh shoot those out and share those with them, trying to help build our brand and our credibility with this important audience. But our most important audience has to be those companies that are already here. Working in concert with the Governor's Office of Economic Development, over 50 of Sioux Falls companies have had visits. New announcements that we've been substantially involved with include Capital One, EDCO, TCF Bank, Twin City Fan, STEM Fuse, Central States Manufacturing, Metal Sales Manufacturing, Gun Up, Animal Health International, and last week's announcement of Glanbia Nutritionals. These projects total some 890 projected jobs. And I want to thank you for your role in helping make this happen. The additional support that you provided to the Development Foundation frees up funds for us, allowing us to help close deals such as Twin City Fan. As an example, they needed major electrical upgrades to renovate the new building they were going into. So we purchased an electrical switch gear for them and we lease it back to them at a nominal rate as long as they meet their promises of projected job growth. I also need to thank the mayor, Darren, Brett O'Neill, Dave Loveland, as well as Mark Cotter, Mike Cooper, the GIS staff, um, for all their assistance in responding to the sometimes daunting timelines of these prospects and for helping package our responses. You know, honestly, um, their, the effort of the GIS staff, uh, public works, of uh, community development, uh, they've really, really helped us respond to them not only in a timely manner, but in, a, in an appearance and a professionalism that we probably couldn't have done on our own. Um, I think we work together well as a team. We're actually trying to get together on a weekly basis to review projects and plans for upcoming hostings. And uh, lately it's actually been probably a lot more frequent than that because we had some good projects to work on. In short, Sioux Falls is very strong. We're ranked as the ninth strongest local economy in the United States. I put in your packet some of the data we collect. <coughs> Excuse me. 
As near as we can tell, at the end of 2012, we'll, we will be up approximately 2,500 jobs from the end of 2011, and that's a lot. Our activity levels are as high as I've ever seen them anywhere that I've ever worked in the country. So unless the fiscal cliff does us in, we think 2013 is going to be uh, equally as strong. And with that, that's just kind of a broad overview of kind of what we've been doing and where we are. And I'll be happy to field any questions that you might have. Thank you, Slater. Questions from Council? Exciting numbers. Councilor Jamison? Would, do you have questions for Slater? Well, I feel bad that maybe I missed uh, the beginning, uh, Slater. I apologize. How much does the, does the city council authorize or allocate in funding for you? 275000 And has that always been the number, or has it been up or down? What? It's up. It, it typically was 175. When I refer to the additional funding that you've uh, provided to us, and that allows us to do things like that switch gear that we uh, made available to Twin City Fan. That's what I was referring to. All right, thank you. Councilor Rolfing. Slater, the, uh, I guess, refer was it a referendum or whatever it was that uh, tore down the um, extra funding that would, would have been available through the state um, for you know, going after f corporations and things to South Dakota, is that gonna, I'm sure you didn't build any of that money into your budget, but how do you see that affecting some things that you could have done uh, possibly in, uh, in the future? Yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, the, the whole issue of incentives is one that's uh, charged on both sides with a lot of misinformation. Um, the reality is, is that uh, it is a very competitive environment for these jobs. And, um, you know, I, I refer to these site selection consultants. They're very, very, a, a couple of things. They, uh, they really see their job as providing a company with, say, three locations that are all uh, equally viable and good locations for that particular uh, facility. You know, and a lot of things go into that. It's not incentives. A lot of things go into that, like distribution channels and customers and suppliers and, uh, you know, um, just a whole variety of factors, labor and workforce. But at the end of the day, if they can get three communities that are, are equally well suited to the project, then it becomes, uh, so where's the best place for us to go? Where's the best return for our shareholders? And so that's really when the incentives come into play is, um, kind of towards the end of the project where you're, they're trying to figure out, uh, so where is the best location for us? And when we run our financial analysis and back it out, you know, where is that going to be? And so, yeah, I think that it does hurt us not having uh, a large project refund. Uh, South Dakota wins on any type of long-term analysis, but unfortunately for large projects, we hit more taxes on the front end of the deal um, other states tend to tax more over the length of the project. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a weighing and balancing. Councilor Karski. Slater, I just attended last week the National League of Cities Convention out in Boston and was able to sit in on many economic development meetings where I got to hear from other municipalities, I guess, on what they're up against. And a lot of times it boiled down to they were very dependent upon one certain sector of the economy, whether it be aviation or manufacturing, et cetera. And when I look at our little pie chart here and I see that we have such a diverse, and when I hear you talking about the companies, Twin City Fan, TCF Financial, um, New Glambia, um, Capital One, et cetera, I mean, very spread out and it's impressive and it's what our our local economy needs to insulate ourselves from those downturns that can happen in any one industry at any time. So thank you for what you do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to that point, that's why we're the ninth strongest economy in the United States is our diversity. And uh, it's also why it was difficult to come up with a, uh, a value proposition because, you know, there's other places. If you go to Memphis, they are the distribution center of America. If you go to Nashville, they, they lift themselves up as the music capital of America. 
we're very diverse. And so we end up saying, well, we're really good in a lot of things. And, uh, you know, that doesn't make for a good sound bite. You know, it, it's, it's harder to communicate. So we really, that's why we ended up with uh, uh, a pretty simple expression of we believe we have a better business climate and we have a better lifestyle. It made me appreciate living here, I can tell you that. <laughs> Other questions? Councilor Staggers. Uh, Slater, is the uh, Development Foundation uh, working on trying to improve the business climate in Sioux Falls even better than it is now? Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, we want to look at uh, whatever um, makes us less competitive. And um, so, you know, anything that we can do to kind of to help improve the uh, business climate that doesn't hurt the quality of life overall, then that's what I think we would be supportive of. Uh, more specifically, uh, various city regulations, uh, any attempt to maybe take a look at those and see if we can maybe make some better regulations or? Yeah, no, we would be, we would be glad to undertake that kind of conversation with, uh, you know, the community development staff and, and uh, kind of think through that thing. And even on our part, uh, it behooves us to do that when we do our next industrial park uh, at some point in the future. Then one of the things that we have to look at are their, you know, our own covenants and restrictions. And do they adequately uh, provide protections but not provide onerous regulations as well? Councilor Anderson. Slater, in your conversation with businesses that are looking at Sioux Falls as an option to move to, what are some of the concerns you're hearing from those businesses? Uh, I would say probably the number one concern that always comes up is uh, quality and quantity of the labor. So that's something that we have to address and in fact, um, this, this is more of a general uh, demographic breakdown, Sioux Falls and the MSA, who we are. Um, but we have one that's kind of more specific towards the recruitment process. And one of the things that I've done in it is I combine the population chart that you see here on the front with the growth in labor, uh, the growth in jobs. And so I try to make the point to them that because Sioux Falls is a growing community, that uh, our MSA is actually growing at a higher rate as it should be than the number of jobs and that that has stayed pretty well in equilibrium and balance. So at any one time you may have shortages or surpluses, you know, in a specific uh, skill or sector, but overall it stayed in pretty well balance and we've been able to uh, balance our population growth with our job growth. <clears throat> and one of your latest wins is a company out of Ireland. Yeah. Um, just, I've been looking at that and their website and everything. What would you state that the pool of uh, employees they are going to be looking for will come from? I, I don't think they'll have any concerns or problems there. You know, that one is a, a fairly high capital investment a fairly low number of jobs. They're talking about 38 jobs initially um, in this uh, food processing area. Uh, they actually met with, uh, Ken Baptist was kind enough to meet with them when they initially visited the community. And so they really heard straight from the, you know, straight from uh, someone with deep expertise in labor in this area uh, in that, in the uh, food processing industry uh, here's what it's like. And uh, they were very favorably impressed and I think they pay really, they, they are gonna pay very good wages. And so uh, I don't think they'll have any problems at all. No, and I guess what I was leading to is, are the pool of applicants they're gonna be looking at uh, maybe come from like South Dakota State uh, College, something like that since they are a dairy uh, based uh, company? Yeah, their, their parent company is Glanbia, which is an Ir Irish company. This is a, a subset called Glanbia Nutritionals, and so they're, doing, they're processing flaxseed. And uh, so a little bit different skill set. Um, the gentleman that is going to be managing that facility is named Max Healy, and uh, he's an extremely nice young man that will be moving from uh, Canada uh, here to Sioux Falls. And um, you know, he has indicated to us the skill sets that we've seen have ranged from those degreed positions that 
uh, his, his actually skill is in uh, um, molecular, molecular biology, I believe. And uh, so he's a scientist in, you know, in that kind of area, and there'll be skills like that, but then there'll also be those people that, you know, ramp down and perform uh, more, uh, uh, more menial tasks and, uh, you know, kind of keep the, keep the seeds flowing through. So there'll be a variety of positions in there. Thank you. Other questions from council? I do have a couple. Slater, I want to go back to that idea of regulations for companies that, that I, th I think of you of courting them. I know you're not really, but the, those folks that you're looking at and trying to attract to Sioux Falls, are there concerns from those companies that there are regulations here that, that are keeping them from coming to Sioux Falls? Are, I mean, Councilor Staggers asked you about regulations. Do we need to be changing regulations? Are, is that a legitimate issue with some of these folks? Are, are the things that we do and say in Sioux Falls keeping us from attracting folks from other places? I don't think that they're, they're keeping us from it. You know, um, I, I would say that there's always room to kind of uh, streamline the process, particularly once they made the decision. As far as things that, are, that we have in place that are keeping someone from coming here, that are preventing them from making the decision, I don't find that to be the case, you know. Um, we do run into things like Glanvia, for example. We needed to get a variance on the, uh, the height of the building was 69 feet. We have a 60-foot limitation, and that process went through very smoothly. Um, so, you know, th there's processes in place, but they are, there are in all of these other communities as well. You know, I, I do think that we do have to keep an eye on it, and you have to be ever vigilant to make sure that you... Um, kind of have an ear out for issues that are harming them, that are preventing them, you know, that, that they raise as red flags. But I don't really get that on the front end. You know, you, you more, when a company comes and they start through the construction process and they're working with, you know, all the issues of permitting and approvals and everything, then, you know, from time to time something will flare up and you'll go, uh, you'll have to um, kind of, see if there's a middle ground and it, it could be anything from fire codes it could, to uh, electrical requirements, you know, to all those things. But that's pretty typical in the process. I can just tell you that I've always run into those issues. And uh, this is the third community that I've worked in in economic development. Well, and so many of our zoning regulations and construction regulations are really standardized. They're the International Building Code, the International Fire mm -hmm. Code. The other th comment that I would make then is that I know that uh, Darren Smith's crew has tried to make that a one-stop shop in terms of those things. But then my, my charge to you would be if there are issues, those are things that council really does need to be dealing with. But then my other question is regarding local businesses that are already here, entrepreneurs that are maybe starting with new ideas, new you know, new businesses, are we doing, are you, from your standpoint, you're looking a lot at site selection from other folks out of state, out of Sioux Falls. Is there any effort toward helping those that are already here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, uh, you know, one of the things I mentioned is that we made, uh, between us and GoEd, we've made uh, 50 visits to uh, local companies. So th those tend to be more larger, uh, more established firms in, uh, in the Sioux Falls, in the Sioux Falls MSA. For the startups, um, Rich Nazer and the Technology Business Center, I serve on their board of directors, and they're just all over that. They, they are uh, um, rapidly approaching full occupancy uh, out at that facility. And so, yeah, I think that um, the effort is it, it's, you know, it becomes very difficult. There's a lot of people trying to assist in entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, we, we had a discussion at this last board meeting about Coordinating all those activities can be uh, can be a little complicated uh, because there's so many people doing so many uh, things oriented towards the entrepreneurs. Good, great, thank you. Other questions from council, Councilor Staggers. Well, uh, it's more of a comment about the regulation situation because uh, a number of years ago I became aware of a company right here in Sioux Falls, and they wanted to expand uh, rather dramatically and build a very large building, and I was simply told by the um, person heading up the company. They had such a difficult time with the city. They just said, forget it. We're going to build it somewhere else, and they did. And so every time I go from Sioux Falls to Omaha, I look off to one side of the interstate, and I can see their building there, and thinking that should have been in Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, 
Thank you for that comment. Is, is that something you can speak to, Slater? Uh, I don't know the, uh, I think that was before I uh, yeah, came to the community, time. but uh, so I'm not familiar with that exact example. But I, I will say that whenever we do, uh, I think having uh, a liaison such as Brent and uh, Dave and Darren, you know, within the system, that when issues come up, as they inevitably will, uh, that we've got, we have advocates that are able to uh, kind of work um, uh, within the system and see if there's common ground that can be found. Uh, um, you know, I mean, it is a challenge because you have the uh, financial interest of the company and often the safety interest of the public, um, and you're trying to, you know, trying to make those meet. Okay. So, like everything we do, there's a lot of negotiations and. Uh, you know, trying to, playing what if games. What if we did this and what if we did this, would this be better for you? Great, good, thank you Slater. Any other questions, comments from council? All right, thank you very much for your work thank and you. for your report, we appreciate thank it. Thank you for your support. Moving on in presentations, Kendra Simmons, my project manager, gonna talk about the top 10 project update. Hello, how's everyone? Kendra Simmonsma from the Mayor's Office. I always appreciate the opportunity to spend a little bit of time addressing um, Council and also the citizens of Sioux Falls talking about the projects that are going on in the city. If you recall, I was here early this year, I think in January or February, so Councilor Staggers, I don't think I was able to present in front of you. But what we're gonna do today is just give you an update on all of the top 10 projects that are going on. And then specifically, I wanna bring your attention to two new projects that are on our list. And then also have a, um, a little bit of a more detailed presentation from one of our top 10 projects, um, Live Well, Sioux Falls, from Alicia Calera. So here is our updated top 10 city projects list there as they were previously just listed in alphabetical order to not take away the importance of one over the other. They're all very important and we've all allocated all of the appropriate resources to support um, each one of these projects and to ensure their success. You'll notice right off the top that the 2025 downtown plan and the very one listed at the bottom, the Spellerberg master plan, are the two new projects that are on this list and so we'll talk about those in the um, um, future slides. I just want to briefly go through each one of these projects and then we'll um, update you on some significant milestones and we'll move from there. So we'll skip over 2025 downtown plan and we'll go right into the event center. You all are very familiar with the event center. That's obviously my personal um, project as the project manager and that's being supported out of, championed out of our mayor's office with um, Mayor Mike Huther. The iDrive Financial Management Project, it's renamed. When I was here before, it was just called the Financial Management Project. They've renamed it to iDrive. That's being led out of our finance department. Tom Huber is the project sponsor, and Krista Stusi, she is playing the role for project manager for that project. The Land Management Integration Project, and you see the acronym LMI, they're, they're starting to use that. That's being championed out of two Two of our departments are Public Works Division, Engineering Division, as well as Planning and Building Services. So um, Chad Heavey and Kevin Smith are the project sponsors for that project, and Deborah Kayakowski is leading as a project manager. Both of those two projects, just to remind you, are software implementations, but they're really giving the city the opportunity to look at their business processes and improve the way that we communicate, not only internally with how we interact with each department, but then also um, to help better serve the customers, which are the citizens of Sioux Falls. The Live Well Sioux Falls initiative was called the Community Health Transformation when I was here earlier this year, and Alicia Clare will speak more to that project at the end of this presentation. You're all familiar with the pension plan project. It still remains on the top 10 list because we have to go through the implementation steps to proceed the, the, the vote that was passed by the employees on the changes to the pension plan, so that'll move forward to the state to take um, the next step, so that remains on the top 10. Prairie West Library continues to be a top 10 project. It's led out of our library department from Mary Johns leading as the project sponsor, and the project manager role is actually filled by um, one of our engineers, Dina Knutson. 
the railroad relocation continues to be a top priority for the city from a project management perspective. Mark Cotter leads that as the sponsor, and Josh Peterson, as one of our principal engineers, is the project manager. River Greenway continues to be on our list. There's continuing activity for River Greenway. Um, Don Carney from our Parks and Recreation Department is the project sponsor, so he's really championing that effort, and the project manager role is being played out um, from an engineering staff, our principal engineer, Brad Ludens. And then, um, as we talk, the Spellerberg Master Plan is a new project on the list, and we'll go in a little bit more detail here in the next slides. So what I want to do now, because we, I just quickly walk through each of the projects, what I want to do now is just touch on some of the major milestones that have occurred on these projects since the last time I was here. And I'm just going to start with iDrive. One of the very first steps um, that any project has to go through is actually to kick off the project. And so that occurred this past summer. And one of the things that they were able to accomplish was to actually obtain a better understanding of, of the technology that the new systems would be providing. And that was a really an important step because it allowed buy-in for the, all of the project team as well as to really understand how to set up the system to help um, the end users um, in the long run. Also, another milestone that was completed on this project was that the initial ledger system was set up. And that's a really big deal because that really does set the framework or the, um, if you think about like the way the data is going to be stored and, and accessed, the ledger is the backbone for that. So that's a big milestone for that project to complete. This project is also looking at um, some additional changes to the contract to add some additional functionality. And you can see there with that fourth bullet, um, they would like to add work orders or also um, known as service to the contract and I believe that the project will be coming forward for council consideration later this month or early in January to talk further about that. But what that functionality is, is actually allows um, mainly the public works team to start using it as a tool for scheduling maintenance, preventative maintenance activity, and for follow-up and service request work. And so it's a really big functionality that wasn't known at the time that we started this project, but after we've engaged departments and had many conversations, it became something that would really add value, um, specifically right away to our public works team. So we're excited about that. And you'll, you'll hear more from the project manager or from um, Tom Huber on that change order. And then just to just keep everyone up to speed, this project is continuing to be on track and scheduled for completion by January of 2014. The next update I want to give you is the land management integration project. Again, um, this project kind of had the same timeline as the iDrive project, and so initiation and planning got started this summer. And so that's been completed, which is great because you need to have a good roadmap and a project plan in place before you can really start, start moving. So they were able to su successfully complete that. And then what they're doing right now in the month of December is they're completing their assess and define activity. And what that means is that they're meeting with all of the departments and divisions involved in using the system and identifying their current business practices and then determining what changes would be needed with the new system. And so at this moment, they're actually redefining what they're going to do to make um, their job easier. So it's an exciting part of the process. The next step that will happen um, the beginning half of next year is really start to configure, the, the techie term, configure the system, to actually set up the system the way that the departments and the division and the users really will need to see, to see it. So that will happen um, beginning of next year. And this project has a little bit of a shorter timeline from an uh, implementation schedule, and it's scheduled to be done at the, this time next year, so it's exciting. I want to briefly update you all on the River Greenway milestones. Everyone is well aware um, we had a beautiful ribbon cutting ceremony this last June for phase one being complete. And these pictures just show in the evening and then also just from, from afar across from the river, the, the work for phase one. Construction was, was completed in June and then the ribbon cutting was held. And so we're all very proud of the phase one completion work. 
And what's going on right now for phase two is that construction is in progress and that just, just this past November, um, they were able to open up the bike trail to have open access to the public for that. So that's a really big deal. One of the things that they're continuing to work on um, into the spring of next year will be the landscaping work and then the 8th Street ramp connection to access this part of the Greenway. The next update, major milestone on one of our top 10 projects is the Prairie West Library. You can see that construction is well underway. You can see there's those pictures showing both the exterior side of the buildings and then also interior. And besides the construction, other activity that's going on is that we're currently ordering all the opening day collection. So you know, you need to have stuff in the library. So that work is going on right now. And they're gearing up to do the staffing activities um, early next year. And they're also looking at all the activities around the furnitures, the fixtures, and the equipment, or FF&E. They're working on that as well. So the Prairie West Library is moving along quite well. And we expect a completion um, in the summer of next year. The last two updates before we get to the new projects are quickly all on one slide. The event center project, you guys, um, I'm able to come here once a month and give you an update. So I just wanted to note that we'll be coming again here on the 18th to give you a full update of the event center. But in general, especially for the citizens of Sioux Falls, the big activities that the event center project has completed, which we're all aware of, is that we've started construction. There's a project webcam available 24-7 if you ever want to see um, see the activity. It's SiouxFalls.org forward slash live cam. There's also, we've also in the summer, we're able to secure the title naming rights. So we're now referring it to the Denny Sanford Premier Center. And then also another major milestone for the project was securing the operator food and beverage agreements with SMG Innovations. The next update on the railroad relocation, and again, um, this project will be giving you a more detailed update um, here next Tuesday, December 11th. Mark Cotter will be coming with Joshua Peterson to provide you a more in-depth update. But the big milestone that was completed for this top 10 project was that a new alternative has been identified. And that, really re-energized the project. Burlington Northern came um, with a new alternative in, in August and really started to look at their overall regional um, operations and the current technologies and how they, they work, how the trains work um, today. And because of that, they are now, now looking at an alternative that a new yard would not be needed and that th there would be an alternative for the city to purchase the existing yard with only minor changes um, needed elsewhere, minor improvements needed elsewhere in the um, rail yard system, railroad system. So I just wanted to highlight that's a major milestone um, and new direction for that project and Mark Cotter and Josh Peterson will come with further detail next, next um, meeting. I'm going to focus now a little bit and talk about the, new, the two new projects on the list. The 2025 downtown plan. Uh, first of all, that's being championed or sponsored from two, um, two of our areas, Darren Smith out of Community Development and Mike Cooper out of Planning and Building Services. They're really championing this project, and Brent O'Neill has been assigned um, the role as the project manager. This project is really getting kicked off um, early next year. They're just in the, in the scoping phases now. But the purpose and the reason for this project and why we believe it's a top 10 project is because really want to build upon the current 2015 downtown plan that has served us well, but we want to continue to provide um, a vision for downtown, and so this is why we're highlighting it as a top 10 project. It notes here that the timeline um, is going to start next year with the um, intent to be completed by the end of next year. Some of the, the, the number one goal that both Darren and Brent have expressed when we talk about this project is the importance of getting stakeholders, all the stakeholders involved in identifying really what is the goals for downtown moving forward. And so I just wanted to highlight that as one of the um, st table stakes for this project is that goal to, inv to involve as many community um, stakeholders that are impacted by the downtown community. The initial outcomes that you'll start to see for this project is that they're going to not only identify the, the goals for the community moving forward, they're also going to highlight any of the strategic city priorities and investments that would impact downtown moving forward. They want to be able to provide a basis to support all of private sector growth 
in downtown. And then this was, this, was a, this was an interesting outcome, but they really believe that to really move forward, they want to provide specific benchmarks for the downtown area to strive to achieve by 2025, to really show measurement of the 2025 downtown plan. So going forward, look for updates from Darren Smith, Mike Cooper, and Brent O'Neill on this project. And then the second project that's an add um, to the 10 is the Spellerberg Master Plan Project that's being sponsored out of our Parks and Rec area from um, Don Carney will be the project sponsor. And playing the project manager role is Tori Miedema. And they are actually trying to get on um, council agenda for an informational update here this month, but I'm not sure if that's been scheduled or not. But I just wanted to provide an overall um, review and just let you know that they're working to provide a more detailed update on that project. The main activity around the Spellerberg Master Plan for the next six months is really to hold um, focus groups and public meetings to try to determine um, the facility amenities and what is needed. And they also want to develop programming for, for the space. They want to have a schematic design in place so that they can also determine probable construction costs and then also determine an operational business plan. So they have um, lots of tasks that they're trying to pull together. Um, and, and I know that Don and Tori will provide you details on, on the scheduling and how this is all going to come together. I want to remind um, council and then also the public that all of these projects can be found um, on our SiouxFalls.org website. And then additionally, internally, for council and, and um, employees and staff, there's a, a separate page that is basically the same information that you can access internally for our top 10 updates. So you don't have to wait for me to come up here on an on a, um, irregular basis to give you the update. The, all this information is available internally and also externally on our website. And what I want to do now is, be, before questions, is turn it over to Alicia Calera, who's the project manager for the Live Well update. And we're tagging this um, in-depth presentation to the top 10 because it is a top 10 project. And we, it's just good timing for her to come up as well. And then when she is done, we'll, we'll open up for questions on the entire presentation. Great. Thank you, Kendra. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you. Good afternoon. I don't feel like the picture of public health with these cough drops, but I'll do my best. And <laughs> I promise I'm not contaminating the, the stand here. I am Alicia Calera, Assistant Director of Public Health, and I'm here to give the update on Live Well Sioux Falls. Whenever I speak about Live Well, I do like to take a moment to remind ourselves why this is important work and why the health department and public health in general is uh, changing directions, so to speak, and focusing so highly on prevention. We know that poor health decisions cause the majority of de disease and death in our communities and in our nation. We know that poor health decisions have a high cost, not only on a personal level to families, but on our communities and nation as well. In fact, um, preventable diseases, avoidable conditions, uh, slow down our economic growth, and cost our nation hundreds of billions of dollars a year. So what we would like to share with you is that health decisions can be influenced by the municipalities, both in policy and environmental changes. The socioeconomic model, which is there for you, tells us that decisions are really influenced by cultural norms, public policies, our friends and neighbors, all of those things around us. And so if I were to give our elevator speech, it would be that um, Live Well Sioux Falls is the promotion of health in all decisions on the continuum from the individual to the policy level. Thank you, Kendra. I also just always like to briefly share that we use the National Prevention Strategy as our guide. The prevention strategy recommends that we adopt four strategic directions as communities. They're to create, sustain, and to recognize healthy and safe community environments. Ensure that our systems are integrated and mutually enforcing. Support individuals in making healthy choices and improving the quality of life for all Americans. 
So for 2012 and Live Well, it was really a building year, and I'm just going to briefly go through what we feel were milestones for the project. First of all, in December, you will see the release of our community health assessment. We used a collaborative approach with many, many tens of community partners in completing this report to evaluate all sectors of our community. We also established a Live Well co coalition. We have an internal team, of course, at our health department, but almost every city department is rep recognized and um, participating with the Live Well team, including the city council, as well as 90 individuals in our community representing over 40 organizations that are now committed to moving Live Well forward. When we originally spoke to you over a year ago, you'll know that the Community Transformation Grant was the seed money to really start this effort. And at that time, we told you that we had adopted three directions, healthy and safe physical environment, tobacco-free living, and clinical preventative strategies to guide us through the course of the five years. What we outlined in year one for those first two items were really related to our community assessment community assessment and doing a policy and environmental scan. So we have exceeded the progress that we um, first laid out in our grant proposal. And then we also promised to do 5,000 blood pressure screenings and provide education to community residents. And through our big squeeze effort, we exceeded that goal as well. Finally, a piece of um, Live Well, a big piece of it is really just public awareness. And we had numerous press conferences, numerous press releases, community, community meetings, education sessions, as well as a survey that was taken by over 2,500 Sioux Falls residents to really engage our citizens in this process as well. So the next two slides, what I'm going to share with you is just a sample of what we found in our community assessment. Please realize that our full report is being released in December, and it also will include more information across our sectors. But every time that I come to you, I want to advance our conversation a little bit further. Let's talk about how we assess the community. The first way is we took the CDC CHANGE tool. And CHANGE stands for Community Health Assessment and Group Evaluation. In this tool, all sectors of our community are evaluated, including community institutions, work sites, schools, healthcare, and the community at large. And this is really those sectors doing that work. So for instance, work sites. When we come to you with data on work sites, that's not the health department huddled together in a room providing recommendations for work sites. We really partnered with several small and large work sites in our community to evaluate themselves, so to speak, and provide the information. And that would be the same for the community at large, which I'm going to share with you now. The team of the group that evaluated the community at large was about 12 to 15 city staff who all brought their own expertise to the table. The purpose of the tool is to really do that environmental and policy scan on five health topics physical activity, nutrition, tobacco, chronic disease management, and leadership. Again, this is specific to the community at large, which is the city of Sioux Falls, which is the work that we all do. The CDC also helps us interpret this data by saying that anything that falls below that 60% mark would be identified as an opportunity or something to elevate in our priority level. <clears throat> so just very briefly, knowing that I will be going through more details of this at a later time, just to share with you what is included in each of those sections. Physical activity looks at walking routes, biking routes, land use, public recreation facilities. Nutrition will look at things like farmers markets, community gardens, how do we partner with our retail and our restaurants to promote healthy options? How do we ourselves promote healthy options with our uh, municipal buildings and our venues? Tobacco evaluates uh, many policy level and environmental conditions, some of which are state level decisions, but others can be influenced at the municipal level, such as outdoor restrictions on tobacco use, or how do we access and promote cessation services in our community. Chronic disease management is really a measure of 
our health promotion to our residents as well as how are we involved ourselves in community coalitions to influence public health prevention. And finally, leadership. The gist of leadership is really how do we put in our city budget um, those activities which create healthy community design. We know that we do it within our health department budgets, but how do we expand out beyond the health department and include um, financing of healthy community design? The second piece the, of, uh, the second area that was quite large of our assessment was our resident survey, as I mentioned earlier. The, the survey was quite long, so we were very fortunate to have over 25 residents complete it. And I thought, I think that really shows the engagement that people are really willing to take the time that it took to t do this survey. I just pulled out this question as a sample. Sioux Falls residents were asked to um, provide what they perceived as the top unhealthy behaviors in Sioux Falls. They identified alcohol abuse, poor eating habits, smoking, tobacco use, and the lack of exercise. What I thought was remarkable about these answers was that they completely align with what the CDC tells us are the top four causes of preventable death. You'll just notice that they're in a different order. So we have quite an intuitive community out there. We will be using other data sources for our survey, or for our assessment, including CDC data, demographic data. We've got some interesting GIS data on community, mapping community assets, all kinds of things. So again, a snapshot of some of the things that we're finding. What I'd like to share is that as we move into December, we're going to have our last coalition meeting of the year, December 19th from noon to two o'clock at the main library. I would invite and welcome uh, council leadership and all council members to please attend that as you are able to hear more about the coalition and the release of the report and the strategies that we are going to recommend to our coalition that we move forward to impact the health of our community. And we will be asking for the recommitment of our partners as well. So that when I come back to you in the first quarter of 2013, I'll share more details about what we are adopting as a Live Well Coalition to move forward. While I'm at the podium, I must thank my core team, Jennifer Johnson, Rana DeBoer, and Jean Reed, as well as the city directors and the city staff who have put lots and lots of time and resources into this project. Also, we have many community partners who are committed to the work of Live Well, and I thank them. Finally, I would like to announce some good news um, for the Live Well project. The Wellmark Foundation, out of 135 applications, chose to fund the Live Well Coalition team with a Wellmark grant called Live Well Sioux Falls Commute Active. The purpose of this grant is to promote uses um, in our community of modes of transportation that are not driving, that are walking and bicycling. This grant was developed by city staff, again, who are assigned to the LiveWell team, and I thank them. Rana DeBoer, Sam Trebelcock, Russ Sorensen, Heath Hofteaser, and Adam Roach. I thank all of them for this, the development and the execution of this project. And to quote Foundation Director Matt McGarvey, this project was selected because of the committed stakeholders in the Live Well Coalition and the great potential for making a big impact on the health and well-being of the overall community. So with that, I would thank um, Wellmark for this grant in the amount of approximately $20,000. I would also recognize that Stephanie Perry from Wellmark is in our audience today. She represents Wellmark and she's also a person and a member of our Live Well Coalition. So with that, I'll say that this is the conclusion of the top 10 project update and also my update. So Kendra and I will be happy to take questions. Great, thank you very much, Alicia. I appreciate it and thank you, Kendra. First of all, thank you to Stephanie and to Wellmark. That's an amazing gift, the $20,000 grant and what, what a great name, Commute Active. It'll be exciting to see where that goes. So thank you very much, Stephanie, and thanks for being here today. Questions from Council on either the Top 10 or on the Live Well project? Councilor Jamison. I have a question on the Top 10 with Kendra probably. Sure. On the uh, Spellerberg. You know, uh, the, the Council had uh, allocated some funding for an aquatics master plan for the yes. city. Do you know where the status is of that? I do not know the status, but it's not part 
of the initiative that we, uh, we were just speaking of. It's not part of Spellerberg's? Well, uh, it's, it, the, the scope of Spellerberg was what was on the, on the presentation. Right, okay. But so the additional. Completely separate. Right. Okay. Is, I and didn't see, I didn't see anybody either. Thank and they and, and Don and Tori both um, were did have meeting conflicts, and so because they're coming later, they can address that. But I'll certainly follow up with them, Councilor Jameson. Next week. Other questions from Council? Yeah. Councilor Staggers. Yes, uh, Kendra. Um, the city charter talks about that one of the purposes of the city council is to make policy. And so here we're talking today about these top 10 project updates. That's policy. Does, do we have any city council members dealing with that 2025 downtown plan or the Spellerberg Park plan or anything like this? I don't understand the comment about the top 10 projects being policy. What do you mean, Councilor Staggers? Well, it, uh, usually when I think of policy, I think of a legislative body initiating things, like initiating Spellerberg Park plan. Certainly. Initiating the 2025 downtown plan. Do we have any city council members involved in doing that? I think that the involvement from city council is when the budget gets approved by city council. These projects cannot happen without funding from city council approval. And when I spoke to about um, the iDrive project wanting to add additional functionality to that project, they of course need to come to city council for consideration before they would be able to execute that contract. Yeah, but that's kind of after the fact. After, no, no, sir. After, after, what I'm referring they would, to is they would not they would not um, they would not bring that functionality on into the project without council consideration oh yeah no doubt about it but the thing is from the outset to make policy the city council should be involved right from the beginning like with Spellberg Park all of a sudden we hear about Spellberg Park you know this year and there's a few meetings and we have some money being appropriated for that but as far as the council being involved it seems like we're just kind of on the sidelines these top 10 projects are the administration's focus. It's not to say that there are not other priorities going on in the city, and, and certainly that these projects would not happen without council support from a funding perspective. And so with the Spellerberg Master Plan project, that funding's been allocated previously by council, is my understanding. So we, we're not doing that project um, without your consent. Well. I, I guess to me, I'm just going to point out the obvious. The Spellerberg project began as an initiative from the uh, Parks Department, not from the City Council. They certainly brought it forward to you f from a budgetary item, though. They couldn't move forward without your budget approval. Would that be true? Well, uh, yeah, they could. I'm not saying they'd be, end up being successful, but when you start off making the policy, yes, they can. Hmm. Okay. Other questions from Council? All right. Thank you, Kendra. We appreciate the report. Alicia, thank, thank you. you very much. Moving on, we'll take our election information and update from City Clerk Lori Hogstead and um, City Attorney Dave Fifley. They're going to make their presentation from their seats up here. So, welcome. We are. Thank you. I will go ahead and begin. Um, what we did with our election update is we broke it down into three different segments. And the very first segment that we are going to talk about are the Snowgate petitions. Um, the Snowgate petitions were received a week ago today, uh, November 27th. And the petitions received, our count was 459 petitions. And the petitioner estimated approximately 8,400 signatures on those petitions. That is what we are working on at this time. Uh, once the petitions come in, there are basically three steps to review from the review process to presentation. The first step would be to uh, review the signature requirements on the petitions. And we start by doing a cursory check of all the petitions. They are all numbered. We verify that those numbers are in order. And we begin um, with a cursory check and we review just to be sure that you know, the petitions have been signed by a circulator, they've been notarized. We have a list of items that we review um, based on administrative rule that's part of the state of South Dakota um, provided by the Secretary of State's office. So we have been working on that and we have completed that stage of the process. So we have completed our cursory check 
of all petitions. Um, our next step then is to be doing a random sampling. And this is a procedure that is followed by the Secretary of State. Uh, in fact, they did send to us the spreadsheet that they used to determine this, and our budget analyst, Dave Bixler, has been assisting us with this portion of the project. Um, and we have entered in our information by we, the, the city clerk staff, myself and Denise Tucker and Tamara Jorgensen, have entered in each petition how many eligible signatures, how many official signatures, and how many we've discounted, and why we have said, you know, signature number 10 is not eligible. And then from that point, um, we put those numbers are transferred onto this Excel spreadsheet for the random sampling. And we will random sample 5% of the signatures. So that will be our next step, and we will be starting on that tomorrow. And that step will be to verify using the Secretary of State's voter registration database and, if needed, the county auditor's office to determine if, indeed, this person is a registered voter within the city of Sioux Falls. Um, as I said, we'll start that tomorrow, and that should take us probably two to three days to finish. Um, and the final step of this will be presentation to the council once the signatures um, have been validated and our... Uh, goal at this time is to present those to the council next Tuesday, um, which would be December 11th. And then at that time, um, the council will have 10 days to take action on those petitions. And Dave, is there anything you need to add to this? <laughs> no, very, very thorough. Thanks. All right. I can certainly take questions before we go on to the next. Let's do that, Lori. Let's um, yeah. do questions sure. for each segment that you have. Sounds so let's good. start with questions from council for uh, City Clerk Hogstead regarding the city Snowgate petition update. Questions? Councilor Entman. You know, just to comment here, I would like to thank Lori and Dave for looking at this. I know it came from the direction of leadership that we look at specifically. There were a lot of questions that came out. And I know we wanted to know specifically the procedure that we're going to follow. And I'd like to thank you, Lori, for putting it all together so that we can all understand this and our citizens can understand it also. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. Other questions or comments from council? Councilor Staggers. Yes, on the petition, it talks about that if it is voted in, that it, the snow gates uh, would have to be placed on the plows by November 1st, 2013. Now, the city council, if I'm incorrect on this, let me know, but I think the city council is really going to decide whether we're going to have a special election in the spring of 2013 or whether it's going to be in the spring of 2014. If the city council would decide that the election would be in the spring of 2014, what happens to that November 1st, 2013 deadline? Is that, um, city Attorney Fifley can answer that for Thank us. Thank you. Councilor Staggers, uh, as far as the November 1st, 2013 date on the uh, petition, uh, by state statute, the council, as you know, can decide when the election will take place, and you, you did mention the two options. If the council uh, selects an, a spring of 2013 election time frame, then that ordinance, once initiated and passed by the voters, becomes effective once uh, the official canvas is done. So essentially, uh, depending on our South Dakota weather, the November 1 2013 date would probably be fairly accurate. However, if the council selects to have it at the next annual municipal election, which as you correctly identified is April of 2014, then it, the, a, the November 2013 date cannot control when the council selects per state statute when the election will take place. So then if the voters were to pass and enact the initiated ordinance, it would then take place upon the official canvas of the, say, April 14 election. So once again, uh, the, uh, if the election is in April of 2014, that November 1st, 2013 thing is just kind of mute. It just goes by the wayside. It, because it can't trump yes. state law. Right. right. And so at that point in time, the city council could actually, if they wanted to, just say, hey, we want the snow gates on by whatever date we want. Is that fair to say? Or not again depending on when the election is called it would be within days after the election when the official canvas would be completed and then it's presented in a resolution form to the council if it passes 
it's enacted and its effective date is the second this council yeah. will pass a resolution mm -hmm. recognizing the official canvas. Okay. Does that answer your questions, Councilor? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions on this segment of the report? Okay. All right, let's All right. go. Next, so next one. The next segment um, ties into the election agreement between the city of Sioux Falls and the school district, the Sioux Falls School District. This is on the agenda tonight as, de as a deferred item, item number 24. Um, we are asking for an additional deferral to February 5. Um, and the reason for that uh, deferral is that we have more details to work out as far as um, voting systems, which segues into my next portion of my presentation, and just some details that we need to work out and decide how exactly an election, our next election will be handled. Um, and the, the main uh, focus of this is going to be the e-poll books, what system are we going to use, and as far as putting costs together, we do not at this time have costs put together for that system. We're working jointly with Minnehaha County, as well as the Sioux Falls School District in evaluating those new e-poll books, which is my next item. So that would be my request to give us time to uh, work those things out, those details out. Okay, Councilor Intiman. We did meet on this and I was part of that meeting and I'll tell you, it was an, an exceptional meeting. In theory, we all agree in concept that we need to come up with some standardized polling centers and that we all need to be tuned in. Uh, all of our IT, our IT leads and both the school system and the county and the city need to be part of this so that we understand what is going on. And then, of course, it comes down to the legalese. Uh, we need to have our city attorney, uh, the school system attorney and the county attorneys, uh, they need to agree and we need to have an agreement, uh, a very formal agreement as far as whose responsibilities, how the costs are going to be shared in all of this. There's a lot of work to be done, uh, but I'm confident that we're going to have the uh, ag agreements in hand and hopefully we're going to have everything available we need by the first meeting in February. Right. Questions, other questions or comments from council? My question then would be to this group, because I had heard um, Councilor Entman's report previously about attending that, and I appreciate you standing in for council in, in that situation. Talk to us about then Councilor Stagger's concerns and all of our concerns and about your previous part of the report, that if we decide we're setting that special election, that all these petitions are correct and we're doing this and we're going to do it with the school board in April, if, assume we'd say that, are we going to be ready with this agreement in a way that is, we're comfortable as a city and as a school district? Is that our goal? Yes, our goal would be to be uh, ready with the agreement and and to have our e poll book system, whether we use our current system, which is ESNS, or whether we're going to move forward with the new system, um, to be ready to go and have that in place. Okay. Go ahead, Councilor Antman. And I might state too that although the three of us uh, hopefully will be dialed in, the three entities will be dialed in, uh, the, uh, the other factor in there is the state. And it's my understanding that they're, they're working with the state. Uh, uh, pretty well. We, sh we saw a sampling of uh, what they're proposing and uh, uh, the uh, Commissioner Barth actually was down in Yankton. They used that during the general election and, and he was very impressed with it. He had, his, he, had his, he had a lot of questions when he went down there, but it's very simple, easy to work with, uh, very effective and very timely. It gets, uh, uh, it'll tell you how many people are voting in each precinct almost uh, right away. So it's, it's a very good system. He was very pleased with it. And of course, uh, we'll see as we go forward here. Great. Good. But the goal would be hopefully to have everything on board by the school board election, yes. Great, okay. Other questions from council? Okay, this is exciting stuff. All right, moving on then in the rest of your report on e -poll books. All right, last but not least certainly is the report on the Hart InterCivic presentation. Um, Hart InterCivic is a company located in Austin, Texas, and they were here um, a week ago, Monday, the 26th, to give us just a brief presentation, have an open dialogue about the e-poll book system that they are proposing. Um, of course, Council Member Entman attended, as well as Dave Bixler and Tamara Jorgensen from our office. There were rep a representative from the school district was there, 
and we had a number of representatives from Minnehaha County. We did not have anyone from the state there, although I did talk to Jason Gant the next day and uh, visited with him about the meeting that we'd had. Um, the, the system is pretty unique in that, and this is something I liked about it, it, it came all in one. It's, there's a Dell Latitude um, laptop that's made specifically for commercial use. Um, it includes, and, and it comes into a suitcase, and it includes a barcode scanner, the signature pad, a label printer, and then everything fits into this stackable transport storage case. The, um, the Dell Latitudes are a little bit smaller than a laptop. Um, however, they've, they've uh, cleaned the screen up so that only what you need is there. And according to, I think it was Jeff Barth that mentioned when he went to Yankton that the election workers loved it and in fact didn't really want to give up their duties working on this. And the nice thing is that we wouldn't need to utilize you know, other laptops. These would be only for elections and would be kept in these cases. Um, the Secretary of State's office is also implementing the use of the Hart e poll books, and they have used this system, um, as Councilmember Entman mentioned, in Yankton counties, but also in Sully County, um, Potter County, and Hyde counties. Now, granted, some of those counties are about the size of one of our polling places, but they did successfully use them. Um, in those locations. One other place that they mentioned that they've used them is in Galveston, Texas, and I believe, I believe they said, was it four elections they've used them so far and are, are very, very pleased with the poll books. Um, the one thing that really um, got my attention was the fact that this, this system provides numerous reports, but the one report, and I specifically asked you know, can we tell not how many people have voted at a certain location, but how many of type one ballots have been used? How many of type two? Where are we at in our inventory? And they said, absolutely, that is something that we would be able to furnish. And let's say I was out and about going to a polling place, I could get that email, you know, through my phone and see right then and there, you know, where we need to provide more ballots. Um, a much, much more systematic approach to making sure that we have those on hand. And there's a number of other reports that they can provide, um, but that was the one that was important to, to me, of course. Um, ESNS was a system we used this last April, and they had, uh, we were told that we were going to be able to utilize that system, but we were not able to, and, and so that was pretty instrumental for us. Um, another thing that's pretty neat about these, and, and I had to learn a little bit more about this, is that they utilize an air card, um, which gives much better connectivity and access. I know before we had some connectivity issues, and we ended up utilizing the school server and that type of thing, but um, Bob Litz actually has driven out to a number of locations, including his locations out in outlying Minnehaha County, and tested out these air cards and does have connectivity. And let's just say, for instance, we had an issue at one of the places where, you know, the, the connectivity was gone. Voters could continue to vote, which is not the case with the other system. They continue to vote. They continue, continue to utilize the, the hardware and software. And once that's restored, um, and we would have administrative rights as well as we would have the company, of course, on, on the phone. But once that was restored, it would immediately update what activity had just taken place. So that was nice to know that it wouldn't just stop all the voting. Um, oh, and just, just to kind of give us another little interesting element in all this, the Secretary of State's office is rolling out a new voter registration system. And they're going to call it Total uh, total vote, and they're rolling that out in mid-December. And Tamara and I are attending an election school on Friday here in Sioux Falls, and Jason was happy that we were going to be there as he's going to be um, showcasing this new vo voter registration software. And this software is compatible with the Hart e public system. Um, and we talked about security. They have a, a number of different levels of security that the information is not just stored in one location so that there would be um, they've tried to break you know break into their system so to speak and have had difficulty and their IT gentleman was there as well um, when we met on the 26th but our next as as council member Entman mentioned our next step will be to sit down with um, all the IT teams from the city the school and the county just so that everyone knows the process and and I know the idea 
you know, if, if indeed this is something we choose to do would be for possibly, this was mentioned in our meeting, that the county would purchase the equipment, the heart e poll books and all the hardware that would go with it. And then as a, as a city or as a school district, we would lease that equipment from them. So they would maintain it, update it, um, have, you know, assist us in getting it prepared for election day. And uh, that's, that's what the proposal on the table was, which I think would be a great idea. And again, those are the costs that we need to come up with. You know, what will the cost be for them to purchase the system? Um, and then as well, what will our lease costs be? And then we would need to have um, an agreement for um, assistance, you know, to, to get things set up, an agreement, an agreement for assistance that day, election day, and so on. So there's a lot of details to work out, but I, I thought it was great. I was excited about it. I think Jim was as well, and Dave, and Tamara. So um, we hope that we can move forward with this. Great. Thank you for the report. Questions yeah. from Council. Councilor Aguilar first, and then Staggers. So, Lori, um, we would have costs associated if we were to lease the equipment from the county, but then we would also have some type of service agreement with the vendor himself. Yes, we would, because they would assist us in getting our, you know, our ballot set up on the system and so on, and we would want that, that assistance from them um, so that if we did have, you know, election day issues or whatever the case may be, that we knew we could call them up and, and we would have a service agreement. I believe... I don't think we did receive any numbers on the cost of a service agreement, but it would be a yearly agreement that we would have in place with the company. And if I might, um, also along that line, they monitor on election day also. So they're, they're actually keeping tabs of ballot needs and those kinds of things. And a lot of that, the need for those additional ballots would probably end up coming out from their system too. Go ahead. So then I would see that all of this needs to be written into the agreement. I mean, we need to have the leasing agreement and also the, I know that the council was concerned about the voting places themselves and that is not in the present agreement that we're looking at, is that correct? That is correct, in fact, we talked a little bit about we may need to revisit an agreement with the county as well because if they, if they do indeed purchase these and we lease them, such as we you know, utilize the counting machines, that we would need to write an agreement that would include those counting machines. And then also, just this was nothing that was formalized or in writing, and you know we didn't have all the administrative staff there, but we all were in general agreement that um, vote centers were definitely the way to go, and as well that we would all utilize the same vote centers. The bottom line is, at the end of the day, this has got to be simple for the citizens. We want them to understand that they can go vote at the same place all the time, whether it's they can vote it in, in one area or they can vote in any of the areas, whatever we come up with. So uh, we just want it to be simple for the citizens. Uh, I, the only challenge I think that we have is making sure that when we let our attorneys get into the room, we give them a real short time span to put this together. Right, David? <laughs> Thank you. Present company accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Staggers, yes. please. Uh, Lori, uh, you mentioned leasing uh, this equipment from the, from the county. Yes. Uh, right now, do we lease anything from the county? We do. We have an agreement with the county for the vote counting machines, mm -hmm. um, and I believe, and I would have to look back exactly how that read, but it seems like we either participated in the purchase or we uh, make payment on those machines, but those are jointly owned. So, well, I, I shouldn't say jointly owned, but we utilize those jointly. Maybe okay. that's a better way to say okay. it, since I'm not positive. Okay, thank you. All right. Other questions? Councillor Anderson. Under uh, the system as it is today, Lori, uh, what items does the city own as far as election? We're always putting together election packages. Sure. So what, what, what consists of a package? Well, I would need to, to research that and find out exactly what we own as far as the election equipment. Uh, my, my guesstimation would be very little um, because the, from everything is pretty much headquartered down at the county auditor's office, but I can certainly get a list together for you of what supplies we actually own or own a part of. Okay, if I may. Yes, I guess ahead. my concern is uh, if the county owns the, the systems and everything, um, basically being in charge of software updates, uh, equipment updates, things like that, the county's always saying they're short on money, so 
want to make sure that we have the most up-to-date systems that we can have for each election. I do believe they have money set aside and it's uh, Help America Vote Act that they have some funding through that um, that would they would be able to utilize for this purpose. But that, that's a good point, that we want to make sure that it stays up to date. We did talk about updates to the equipment and so on, even just Windows updates that come in, not only those, but updates to the heart um, voter equipment. And that was a concern that the county um, IT person had too, because they're a very small staff and who would be doing this updating. So certainly that would be something we would have to talk about. And then one more question, yes, if I may. Uh, and then during the election, I'm taking it that the county IT staff would be in charge of making sure connectivity was was uh, continual and any type of troubleshooting would be done through the county IT and then through the company? If I might, yeah, uh, Councilor Anderson, that's correct. It was actually it was on my assistance that we involve the IT departments of both the school and the city because I felt that we just needed to understand or they needed to understand or we need as a city to understand the processes that are going to be involved in getting this handled but you are correct it would be the county's IT team uh, because they do want to be the ones that are responsible for this not us okay so they do want that responsibility so it would be their responsibility to update they actually went through the scenario to about updating uh, the computers themselves prior to an election and it's something that be, can be done with just within all of this all the computers should be able to be updated uh, by just a few of the staff people in a very uh, quick period of time you know several hours and they should have them all updated so they showed us an example of that and they explained it to us too the company did so yes that's correct though you are correct thank you other questions or comments from council well, exciting new adventures for joint uh, yes. powers agreements, I guess we might call them. Super. All right. Anything else for the good of, of this particular report? All right. Moving on. Shauna's coming. We're into the Urban Agriculture Task Force report by Shauna Goldhammer, Zoning Enforcement Manager. Good evening, members of the council. My name is Shauna Goldammer, and as Councilor Erpenbach did say, I am also the Zoning Enforcement Manager, but I'm here today as the Urban Task Force Facilitator to let you know what we've been up to on the Urban Ag Task Force. Um, and so I just wanted to, to kind of bring you up to speed and, and on what we've been doing with that task force, and also kind of remind you how we got started in all of this. Uh, the topic of urban agriculture is really nothing new. Um, it is a topic that is uh, kind of sweeping the nation and a trending topic in uh, uh, ways that municipalities can encourage their citizens to control their own food sources within municipalities. The Urban, Tax, urban Ag Task Force was introduced to the Land Use Committee back in September of 2011, and you can blame me or credit me for bringing that topic forward. At that time, Councilor Erpenbach, Rolfing, Karski, and Anderson thought it would be a good idea to have a public discussion regarding urban agriculture activities. So then at the next meeting, October of 2011, the task force was created. We did nine members four citizens, three staff from dis different disciplines within the city, health, zoning, and animal control, and then two council members. The task force did provide a forum for public discussion. At the first meeting, was held right here in the overflow room of the Carnegie Town Hall on December of 2011. We started out by reviewing current city ordinances, uh, zoning, animal, and health, nuisance type ordinances, and two topics emerged relatively quickly, horticulture and the keeping of animals. What we did then was created a website, and you can link into that from SiouxFalls.org. Click on the uh, Urban Ag tab, and we kept all the information through the public process that we went through with the Urban Ag Task Force. Um, we decided our mission statement was that urban agriculture empowers citizens to grow their own food sources. 
All the handouts that were provided to the task force were posted on that website. Uh, we used a list of municipalities to compare ourselves to and how we would handle these urban agriculture type topics. We uh, posted agendas. We wanted to get the information out to the public and encourage them to help us with this discussion. We also uh, worked on an ordinance along the way, posting the progression of recommendations to ordinance changes, and that was all available on the web. So after December, our first four meetings uh, focused on community gardens. The zoning ordinance was amended, and that was in accordance with Shape Sioux Falls, our 2035 plan. Community Garden Ordinance did go forward in April to the Land Use Committee and was adopted by the full City Council in June of 2012. Then we went on to animals. Now just as a refresher, uh, the current City Ordinances, we do have a chapter um, on the books, Animals and Fowl is its title. Within that ordinance, the keeping of animals and fowl is allowed but not on a scale that's a nuisance. Also, current ordinances do allow that uh, you can keep pets, but we do have a four pet limit, except birds and fish. Now, what you'll find is in the ordinances, there's no definition of scale, so whatever that number is, it can't be to the point that it creates a nuisance, and there's no definition of a domestic pet. So uh, it took us uh, the first thing that we tackled was creating some new definitions to help us uh, discover what we wanted to really talk about. So the animal discussion started in March of 2012. We viewed 15 other municipalities for animals. We had seven meetings throughout the summer and early fall that allowed public input at each. There were also working sessions that were open to the public. I think I counted all total relative to animals. We did have, uh, I think, about 14 meetings total, and um, we'll get to it in a minute, but we're, we're not done. We have one more this week, later this week. But in the ordinance, as proposed by the Urban Agriculture Task Force, we are going to propose some new definitions for a domestic animal, non-domestic animal, exotic animal, fowl, livestock, and pet. Right now, none of those things are defined in the current ordinances of Sioux Falls. We also, at this point, are recommending that no limits for the number of pets. That would not change. Uh, the keeping of chickens continues to be allowed. And remember, currently, chickens are allowed unlimited. So we do recommend, as the task force, that a specific number is provided for clarity. That we would say that six chickens or rabbits is appropriate any place in the city limits. If you want more, what we're proposing is to get a license. Now licensing of animals is still done via the police department. To get a license for more than six of these animals, these urban agriculture animals, you would need to get a petition signed by those property owners surrounding you. And the license would also include restrictions and limitations that had to be conformed to, but also uh, if you failed to conform, that license could be revoked. Now then, there, we also discussed about other types of fowl, including ducks, geese, and turkeys which also would require a license, but because of the um, waste materials that these type of fowl generate, we as a task force will be recommending to you, the council or the land use committee, that these types of fowl get a license. There is no minimum number you can have automatically. But the license procedure would be similar in uh, the process to those who wanted to keep more than six chickens or rabbits. Livestock would be continued to be allowed, but not as a pet. Um, and it would be allowed in an agriculture zoning district. This would include swine, cattle, cows, sheep, goats, mules, yes, goats. We did come up with some prohibitions. Um, 
roosters, the slaughter of animals, and also exotic animals. We added, we are recommending adding some language to the nuisance ordinance for the feed, storage, waste, bedding material, and manure. Um, we're also recommending that shape places, our 2013 zoning ordinance will inc incorporate some setbacks for enclosures where fowl are kept and that they would be uh, no closer than 25 feet to any dwelling that's on an adjacent lot. So again, just to kind of recap what we've been doing, and it sounds like, you know, it's pretty quick presentation for something that we've been working on for over a year. But we did let the public drive this train. We didn't know where it would go. And um, I do think that the citizens of Sioux Falls are the true champions in this process. Uh, we started in, in September of 2011, and our last meeting will be December uh, 6th, which is Thursday, day after tomorrow, and we will be discussing and offering public input on the final draft of the ordinance. Then we'll be forwarding it to the Land Use Committee in January, because December's Land Use Committee meeting has been canceled, and the ordinance will be presented to the Land Use Committee and then the Land Use Committee will decide what to do with it after that. But I would say as if the goal was to have a forum for public input and discussion, we've met that goal and we're ready to uh, provide the information back to the Land Use Committee. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may okay. have. Thank you, Shauna. Appreciate your report. Questions from Council? Councilor Aguilar. Shauna, why isn't there a uh, number given for ducks, geese, and turkeys. I mean, when they apply for the license, is that when the number would be specified? Yes, yes, that there is not an automatic number that you can have by right, we would say, um, for those type of fowl, uh, that you would get a, need to get a license if you chose to keep those. That was the urban agriculture's proposal. Go ahead. And can you tell me where these agricultural zoning districts are? There are quite a number around the city limits. I did have GIS kind of run some numbers, and there's about 2,400 acres of agricultural lands within the city limits of Sioux Falls right now. 2,418 to be exact. Is there any specific part of the city? Are these parts of the city that have been recently incorporated into the city? I mean, can you give me kind of a general idea? I didn't bring a, jo a zoning map. I certainly can, and I will note to self to bring a zoning map along, and so okay. you can see it's a color-coded map where that, that would, would jump out at, yeah. Yes. Good. Other questions from council? Councilor Anderson. No questions. Oh. pot -belly pigs. <laughs> Where are they going to go in or as a domestic, exotic? How would you uh, categorize something like that? They would be categories as other, like swine, and um, there is no special exception. We never had a big groundswell of people who wanted to keep pot belly pigs. So as it is in the proposal, um, the keeping of those type of animals would be considered livestock. Now, if the council passes this, and we'll say somebody does have a pot belly pig here in town as a pet, is that going to be grandfathered in, or is that something they will have to make the adjustments at that point in time? They would have to make those adjustments. We did talk about grandfathering, and the Agriculture Task Force decided not to include language that would uh, allow grandfathering in, the, in these definitions and, and limits, so. Okay, thank you. Other questions from Council? Councilor Jamison. Shauna, thank you for uh, bringing this all together, and it has been a long process. I've tried to follow most of it, but not all of it. Uh, Thanks for having me, because it, it, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to come before you, because I know that you haven't, you know, had anybody from urban agriculture in the informational. So I appreciate being here. It's, it's, uh, there's so many facets to this that it's a, it's a good idea that we all hear it like this instead of bringing it after a land use committee recommends or denies it. 
and then we vote on. I think this is exactly how this should be uh, unfolding. Uh, you and I had a great conversation on the phone a couple weeks ago. Um, remind me again of uh, you know the scale of nuisance. I think we talked a little bit about that on the phone, and you calmed some of my concerns then. And I'm and I'm uh, I'm looking for that again because okay. all these things are creating a. Uh, problem for me like the 80 percent rule and the scale of nuisance uh, I think it does kind of come down to the scale of nuisance for me in this right. whole discussion so help me right it it really the scale language is that the keeping of animals and fowl is allowed but not at a scale that creates a nuisance so what we were finding is that if you had too many and you had too much manure, for example, on your lot, you would clean up the manure, but not getting to the problem. Maybe the problem was that you had too many birds, that it was the scale of that number of fowl or animals that was the problem. And so it was to try to better define and provide clarity on what that scale is. Um, and we heard from both sides of the spectrum. We heard from folks that wanted to outlaw farm animals in the city limits altogether, and they couldn't believe that people would want to keep chickens in town. And, but there is a, a well-educated um, and uh, group out there that do keep chickens, and they want to be able to keep keeping their chickens. So, um, but, you know, there was, it was all about striking a balance between those people who just were appalled by the fact that people like to grow their own food with the people who wanted to grow their own food and control that more for their families. And if, if you could as well, the 80% uh, rule. Mm -hmm. My concern was that uh, an adjoining property owner could be uh, outvoted by his neighbors, mm -hmm. that it's not a problem for someone to have more than the four or six, whatever the, they wanted to get an extra allotment of chickens. The neighbors could outvote. The extra. The extra, uh, true, but they could also outvote the neighbor who is adjoining the property of the chicken coop that's causing the problem. All the others could outvote the adjoining property owner and. Yeah, and, and we did have a real good discussion with the task force, and we started out with only 60% of property owners that were directly adjacent to the property. And the more we talked about it, the more we thought it was important to include people who were across the street or um, that, that they should, you know, their rights as a neighboring property owner could also be impacted by things like smell and noise. So um, that's where we landed, was 80% of those property owners within 100 feet. Now, we kind of emulated, we started with the Minneapolis code. That's how they handle it in Minneapolis, except they make their people who want to keep uh, chickens get petitions of not only property owners, but tenants. Mm -hmm. So say you have a 60 unit apartment building next door, they require the 60% of all those tenants to sign the petition. We thought that was overkill. That property owners would, should be the ones who are made aware of their things that are going on in their neighborhood. Councilor Jamison and then Councilor Karski. The 80% uh, the is the, uh, Shauna, you reminded me of the daycare ordinance that allows for the neighbors or indoor requires neighbors to get on board and sign a petition of somebody who's looking to do the in-home daycare. Right. Uh, I didn't know of any other ordinance that it required or allowed for the neighbors to outvote somebody's essentially pop property rights and, uh, or, or in, in such a way that the neighbors could outvote somebody. Um, I like that analogy. I'm glad you brought that up because I had never even thought of it. I just felt like this 80% rule was going to, uh, uh, I'm not a fan of the 80%. I think it either needs to be 100 or something, but 
I'll, I'll yield the floor for now. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Karski. Thank you, Councillor Jameson. Councillor Karski. As I mentioned earlier, and this is kind of for the benefit of the council, um, when I was at the League of Cities convention last week, they actually had a, an hour-long seminar on urban agriculture, and it was attended by well over 50 representatives from different um, cities around the country. Um, Boston, and a, I can't remember, maybe Jim David could help me with the other two cities, um, one from Tennessee and one from Ohio, I believe. Cleveland and Louisville, okay. And um, they talked about their their laws, and just kind of to give you an idea of what we heard while we were there. Um, Boston, a fairly dense city, actually a very dense city as far as population goes. They, the way their ordinances are, unless they specifically allow it, it's prohibited. So it was kind of a different twist for us. We're more, unless we prohibit it, it's allowed. Um, but kind of more relating to what we're doing, especially with the 80% rule, they, they kind of govern by neighborhood, I guess would be a good way of putting it. And if it's acceptable to the neighborhood, it's acceptable to their government, to their city government. So they kind of allow a neighborhood form of um, decide, defining acceptability, and that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, a lot of other discussion on animals, and it was pretty amazing what some cities would allow it, and it got probably a little bit more um, complex than what we want to do. I always like to believe in keeping it simple, some based it on the total weight of animals and not based on the number, and um, some of them allowed roosters, and I can't imagine us doing that here. But um, it's, so there, it, it is a very heavily discussed topic around all sorts of cities across the country. Um, one other thing that I found of interest on Saturday in the Wall Street Journal, they have a fashion and gift insert, and there were two separate advertisements for buying chickens in the Wall Street Journal fashion insert this weekend. So it is a, it is around a lot. So it's kind of, <laughs> couldn't believe it when I read that. But I just thought I'd give you that input on in what I learned last week at the League of Cities Convention. Great. Thank you, Councilor Karski. Councilor Entman. Yeah. I guess I kind of agree with Jameson. I'm not really too hepped up on this uh, the you know the hundred percent thing I guess is but I, I'll, I'll concede to the the chickens and the rabbits the, the, the part that does bother me though is is when uh, you get over to the uh, ducks geese and turkeys where they actually have to have a license and it says to get that license you need 80 percent of the property owners I almost think that that should be 100% of the property owners in that case where you need a specific license for something that's not already permitted. Uh, again, um, these animals are, are larger, and uh, I guess I just have a, a problem with those. And you know what? That's fine because I've, I've been the facilitator in all of this, and we've, we've done um, a lot of... You know, I've been the devil's advocate and trying to get people to think about what they want. And I've told them all along that this body has no decision-making power. The urban agriculture is out here to get the community talking about it. And at the end of the day, this could not go anywhere. It could be amended. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen between now and the time that it's before the count, full council. It may not get there. Um, and so I welcome comments like that, and you are not going to offend me or anybody on the task force if you think that there's a better way. Good. Thank you, Shauna. Councillor Staggers. Yeah, Shauna, my understanding, of course, the reason that we have the Urban uh, Agricultural Task Force is to deal with nuisance situations. Uh, but, I, dis I disagree with that, Kermit. Oh, okay, well, that wasn't you that wasn't the reason why it was created. Isn't that one of the reasons we're having all these restrictions uh, being looked no, at? No, sir, it Wait, is what's not. What's the reason? The reason is that it is a trending topic to keep animals and food sources within municipalities, and it, as Dean Karski did state, that it is a nationwide topic, and it was a, a based out of the land use committee that they thought that this urban agriculture topic would be one that was well suited for the community of Sioux Falls. And that's why we were talking so about it. So if this is not really a nuisance issue, I mean, why are we dealing with it? Okay, asked and answered. Other questions I will, from... Uh, okay, go I ahead, Councilor Rolfing. That as go the ahead. chairman of, the, um, as of land use and also of the task force. Um, 
we were approached by uh, many people in, uh, on land use of, of how to um, regulate, if you will, or how what kind of regulations mm -hmm. we have for um, urban agriculture. We realized that we did not have many, if any. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we did realize is that um, uh, for community gardens, for instance, we had no regulations at all, and many of the community gardens that we had uh, or that were around were uh, were not legal. So we needed to do something to bring them into compliance, and we thought as long as we were doing that, we would, we would tackle the other uh, parts of urban agriculture at the same time. So I formed a task force to do that, and that's where this came out of. Okay, okay. other questions or comments? So, yeah, yeah, so I don't know, it just sounds like it's we just want to regulate for the sake of regulation because we no. didn't have regulations. No, in the not area. really, because we found uh, over the years and when we started uh, discussing this, that the word nuisance is a very hard one to describe to define. Number one, the word um, what were we talking about here? The word uh, scale. scale. Um, you know what scale to you and what scale to me are two different things, and so uh, in in cooperation with the police department, with some of the other. Um, uh, regulators, if you will, down there, they asked us that if we could define it a little bit more, it makes their job a lot easier, and it also makes it easier for the people of Sioux Falls to know that, you know, six doesn't mean four or ten, it means six, and four means four, and, you know, uh, that kind of thing, and so that's what we tried to do in conjunction with the people of Sioux Falls, uh, um, the, the people that came to the task force meetings and were uh, the public, um, it was amazing when we were there, uh, Commissioner or Councilor Stagger, that uh, when, we, when we discussed this <clears throat> and we came up with what we thought was good wording and then we opened it up to, to public opinion, they would not necessarily correct us, but they gave us ideas that were very, very constructive and in many ca cases, Though that wording was implemented into the uh, into the ordinance, and and so we worked very very closely with the public on this and uh, came up with what we thought was some pretty good language. Good, remind us, Shauna. It's on the website where so that I we, I can go in and read everything. All those conversations, correct? Right, yep. and that's where. Yes, um, SiouxFalls.org. Here, now why don't I just? Do you mind if I oh, take right you through ahead. it? I've got a little link right here. There's the Sioux Falls website, right? We all Good. know and love it. Okay. And <laughs> we know it. <laughs> here, urban agriculture. You can see that link. It's right here. You click on that, and if you scroll down, all the handouts, every municipality, the ordinance as it was being drafted has been all posted here. Our agendas are under this resources tab. And all the agendas of all the meetings are also located there. So SiouxFalls.org under Urban Agriculture. Great. Thank you, Shauna. SiouxFalls.org under Urban Agriculture, as she showed on the, on the graphics. Um, we appreciate that. We, we appreciate the report. And remind us again, Land Use Committee will hear this report. I guess. Urban Ag Task Urban Force Ag is, is this meet. week. One Urban more Ag, time, one, one more, more time. meeting, our final meeting. Um, and we will take comments on that ordinance. The public is welcome and encouraged to come. That will take place Thursday night here at the Carnegie Town Hall. Then it will be um, composed and drafted and through the process to the Land Use Committee in January. Okay. And then it will be up to the Land Use Committee on what to do after that. Great. Okay. I'd encourage the folks to come to that as well. C Councilor Staggers, one more. Yeah. No, I just had, uh, once again, a number of questions uh, about what's happened uh, with the agricultural, Urban Agricultural Task Force. For example, the six chickens. Okay. Uh, we're not having seven. We're not having eight. We're not having nine. Presumably because it is viewed as probably undesirable to, to have more chickens? Actually, right? we started with four because that's the number of pets um, that are currently limited within the city of Sioux Falls. You're limited to four pets. Now, what's a pet doesn't say in the current ordinance. So you could have a horse as a pet, I suppose, and keep it in your backyard. Um, so that was something that we tackled. Uh, so the definition of pet is in there. 
and um, if I could interrupt, hey, I, I'm going to bring us. I'm going to focus us back. This was a report. Shauna has been the facilitator of this group. Right. All of that information is available online. Councillor Rolfing was the chair. Would you like to address that? And then we're our, the hour is becoming late, and okay. so I'm. I'll answer that one uh, very very easily. You know, in our discussion, then we found that it takes about six chickens to produce enough eggs for a fa family of four or five, mm -hmm. and that's urban egg. And that's why we settled on it. That's the kind of discussions we had and why we came to the mm -hmm. decisions that we came at. But you might have a family that has eight or ten. Then you get a license, right? Get a Is license. Right? Okay. Try to get a license. Yes. Right. Try. Okay, uh, because this is an informational session, and again, it is ten, five minutes to six, we need to be back here in an hour. I am going to close this conversation because it is going to go to the Land Use Committee. It is going to go yet to the public, uh, basically a public hearing on Thursday night this week. All of these questions are valid, Councillor Staggers, and I appreciate your participation in it, but we need to move this forward into a public dialogue. I am with that going to adjourn this meeting. We'll be back at seven o'clock for our regular meeting. Thank you.